So uh, I got time to throw another video here together. Wanted to take a minute to kind of talk to you about the link but between the uterine cycle and the ovarian cycle within the male, uh, within the female reproductive system. Um, usually when we talk about the ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle, women are like, oh yeah, well I already knew that. But then when you start talking about how they're intricately interrelated with one another, then it's like, oh, I didn't know that. So let's just go ahead and jump on into this. I've got one slide I wanna show you. It's gonna kind of explain what I'm talking about. And uh, I'll put this up and we'll talk about this and we'll take it on home. This image is commonly seen in textbooks, you know, around the world. It doesn't matter. They usually have a picture in here. But what they don't tell you sometimes is the fact that how all of this is going together. Now, when you read this, what you got to keep in mind is it's kind of like having four timelines stacked on top of one another. And you should be able to start at any point and look straight down below it and you should be able to see exactly what's happening on that exact same day. Now, the bar at the top is the ovarian cycle while the bar at the bottom is the uterine cycle. The bar at the top is telling you what happens every 28 days at an ovary. The bar at the bottom is telling you what happens every 28 days in the uterus. And they're the same 28 days. So day one here in an ovary is day one here in the uterus. Meanwhile, there are two hormones that we have to keep an eye on. They're gonadotropins, FSH and LH, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, both hormones coming from the anterior pituitary uh, gland or anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. Um, these two hormones, however, are both being produced by the ovary. This is estrogen and this is progesterone. Now, we're gonna see hormone levels totally change over these 28 days, and these hormone levels are gonna have a direct impact on these cycles. Check it out. Now, day one of the ovarian cycle is probably not on the average woman's mind, okay? Because on day one in the ovaries, you're pulling out a primordial follicle and you've just upgraded him to primary follicle. And so in the first three days of your ovarian cycle, in the ovaries, you're raising up a primary follicle, which guess what? Inside of it has a primary oocyte, the egg inside. Most women are not worried about this on day one through three of the ovarian cycle because they're dealing with another situation. That woman is probably, if she's not on any type of birth control or any situation, uh, or she's not on a situation where she's on a birth control that where she has an off week, the first three days of the uterine cycle, she's having a period. That period is called the menstrual phase. So the uterus is undergoing three different phases at this time. In the first seven days, first five to seven days of the uterine cycle, are spent having a period. This is the time where we remove the functional layer off the endometrium to prepare to build a brand new functional layer so that when an egg cell has actually been fertilized by a sperm cell, the, um, the, zygote, the zygote, the result of that union, ultimately makes its way down here to the uterus and implants itself on the uterine wall. Uh, meanwhile, back up here in the ovaries, we can see that this follicle is growing and the cell inside of it is growing as well. The follicle wants to take care of the oocyte on the inside, mature the cell, mature the follicle. The follicle continues to grow, the egg continues to grow until we get to day 14 and we have ovulation in which this cell is expected to be removed from this follicle and make its way into the uterine tube where it hopes to, in, to come into contact with the sperm cell and therefore form a union which becomes a zygote and then implant itself on the uterine wall. We'll look at day 14 in the uterus. We've already bypassed the menstrual phase, which is gonna be the period. But now we're in a proliferative phase, which is when we've been regrowing this, uh, this wall, making it and prepping it and planning it out so that it'll be at its optimal growth for that arriving zygote. 
So that 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 cell that's now rapidly turning into a multicellular organism is now coming in and implanting itself on this newly freshly created wall. If the person is actually pregnant, then this 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 then this multicellular organism that's ultimately going to become a fetus, uh, it stays here, and this sends a and and what happens is. If this multicellular organism, which is going to become a fetus soon, is here and it implants itself on the uterine wall, then the corpus luteum, once it forms on the ovary, will stay. It'll stay right here, stuck on day 21. It won't go anywhere, and it will produce a hormone called progesterone, which you can see in this purple line. Notice that progesterone levels drastically increase as the corpus luteum forms because the corpus luteum is the only follicle that is really producing the progesterone. The progesterone levels are non-existent all of these other days. But once ovulation takes place, that vesicular follicle is no more and that vesicular follicle heals up. It expels all of its, all of its fluids it heals up, and then it becomes a corpus luteum. The more the corpus luteum grows, the more progesterone it produces. And that progesterone is the pregnancy hormone. It keeps the body in pregnancy mode. So as long as that fetus is there implanted on the endometrium, then the corpus luteum will go nowhere, and he will continue to produce progesterone. However, if that person is not pregnant, then the corpus luteum will stick around just in case. And then once the body realizes that this person is not pregnant, the corpus luteum will die. It undergoes regression and it becomes the corpus albicans, which when it becomes the corpus albicans, that is a dead follicle. So now it's time to get the new primary follicle ready for the next 28 days. Well, at that point, this regressed and it died. There's no more corpus luteum, as you can see here when you follow the purple line. And so because there's no more corpus luteum, guess what? There's no more, no more progesterone. When that progesterone level drops below the estrogen levels in the female body, it automatically triggers the uterus to now undergo reset. And so the uterus goes all the way back to day one and says, oh, if progesterone is dropped, then obviously there's no pregnancy. So we're going to strip that old layer off and we're going to put a brand new layer there. And because this old layer, uh, with the reduction of progesterone, the old layer, what it does is the blood vessels um, actually uh, are constricted and they break apart, they break off, and that old layer is sloughed off. And the old layer is actually killed. Uh, the blood flow to that old layer is, is constricted. The old layer dies because of a lack of blood flow. It tears away. And uh, because it tears away, those small capillaries underneath are broken and they're torn open as well. And so that's what brings forth the bleeding that's associated with menses or the uh, menstrual phase. And we call it a menstrual flow where the blood and the dead layer is removed from the inside. Meanwhile, there's no corpus luteum, so there's no progesterone level, but the corpus al albicans has died, and now we have a brand new primary follicle. And as the follicle grows, the cells inside of it grow, and the cells inside of the follicle are responsible for producing estrogen. And so as this follicle gets bigger and bigger and bigger, we see the amount of estrogen grow drastically following the growth of the follicle. Now, what caused the follicle to actually grow exponentially like this? Well, that's because of FSH. The FSH that was released from the pituitary gland, follicle stimulating hormone, stimulates the follicle to increase in follicular growth. So we see FSH being released, FSH being released, follicle keeps getting bigger and bigger until finally, We've gotten our job done. There's no need for it to become any larger. Now, FSH tapers off because there's no need for the follicle to grow. We got what we wanted. Meanwhile, a side effect has been LH. LH has been released. And LH is being released in very small amounts. 
and fluid production is taking place inside the follicle. And then all of a sudden you're gonna see what's called an LH surge, where we see a sharp spike in LH production. LH production hits a surge about day 12, and all of a sudden we see this huge spike in LH. Well, LH luteinizing hormone causes this follicle to drastically overproduce fluid, which causes this follicle to burst, it explodes. This is ovulation. The egg is then released, and then once the egg is released, we see a sharp drop in LH levels as well as FSH levels. Because now it's all about this follicle now forming into a corpus luteum, therefore producing the progesterone, therefore contacting the uterine cycle. And all of this is happening concurrent with one another. The same 28 days, different cycles, same 28 days, all of them relying on one another. And that, my friends, is the breakdown of the ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle. So uh, with that being said, if you got any extra questions about what we just talked about, please post a question uh, down below, or you can uh, contact me by posting uh, a message there on the site. We look forward to seeing you soon. Peace.